Welcome everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Joan Towsey. Can you see me? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Uh, and I'm a member of the program team of the League of Women Voters of Champaign County. Welcome to tonight's program with Gloria Yen, director of the New American Welcome Center at the YMCA on campus. Among the celebrations that take place on January 25th every year is that marking the birth of Scottish author Robert Rodney Burns. I could not find anything relevant about Burns in our topic tonight. Yet, if any one of you had a meal traditional on this date, that of eating haggis, well, good for you. I'm glad we're Zooming. <laughs> so the topic of tonight's gathering, understanding our local immigrant community, should be important to all of us living in a community like Champaign-Urbana, where we are fortunate to have uh, various cultures and traditions enriching our lives in many ways, from the variety of businesses providing services to the immigrant immigrant population, including the ethnic cuisine we may enjoy, to the array of visual and performing arts and the like. And yet, what do we really know about the behind the scenes activities that help immigrants thrive and flourish, a phrase used by the New American Welcome Center? We likely have some inkling about the variety of services that are needed and offered to those new to the community, but how are these accessed and coordinated? And that's why we have Gloria again with us tonight. Gloria holds a master's in social sciences from the University of Chicago and a bachelor of music and musicology from the University of Illinois. As an aside, the bachelor's degree is something that Gloria and I have in common in musicology, music history, although from different institutions and in likely different decades. As a US DOG partial, sorry, DOJ partially accredited representative, Gloria provides immigration legal representation for low income and indigent persons in Champaign County. She serves on the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission's Community Action Board. Gloria's commitment to working alongside marginalized community has led communities has led her to interest in human development and disability studies oral history, and most recently, immigration integration. Outside of these important interests, she is a forever foodie, so maybe she's had some haggis tonight. Gloria was given several questions ahead of time. As usual, feel free to add your questions to the chat room, and we will try to address them along the way or at the end of her remarks. Gloria, the Zoom floor is all yours. Thank you for that very lovely introduction, Joan. And no, I have not had haggis before. I actually just had to quickly do a Google search on it and confirm that no, oh, I have right. indeed not. <laughs> um, so really glad to be here tonight. Uh, I actually just very recently returned from Switzerland, which it's like 2 a.m. over there right now. So I'm going to try to be as clear headed as possible because the topic that I'm speaking about today is very close to my heart and I'm very excited to share about it with you. I have some slides prepared. Um, I love that there were questions submitted in advance and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks may have afterward. Um, for the most part, I didn't necessarily explicitly go question by question, um, but really tried to kind of indirectly address um, the nature of the different questions that are coming up. If you submitted a question and don't feel like you got an answer, feel free to um, raise it again with me. So I'm going to pull up my slides. All right, can everyone see? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So understanding our local immigrant community and we're better to start than giving a lay of the land and the demographic snapshot. So um, as of the last decennial census in 2020, there are about 25,000 foreign born individuals living in Champaign County. That means about one in every eight people walking about town are actually foreign born and come with a wealth of 
different traditions, different languages, different contributions to our social and cultural fabric each and every day. Um, on the slide before you, you'll see kind of the breakdown of the top 10 sending communities, sending countries of origin in our community right now. China is number one, which may not be a surprise um, to folks on the call, and Germany, um, which often surprises many, rounding out the top 10. Um, about a third of our population growth over the past decade has been attributed to immigrants, and Champaign County was actually one of only nine counties across the entire state um, that saw the population grow between 2010 and 2019, which is really significant if you're thinking about things like representation, for example. Um, about 40% of our foreign born population is affiliated with the university community. So folks always want to know, you know, is this foreign born presence and immigrant presence in our community just because of the university in part, but not even the majority, right? So about 60 or over 60% are living rooted in the community, raising their families, working long term um, and contributing to our community. One really interesting fact um, that I learned when I was working on census outreach efforts during 2020 with some people um, with the league, including Barbara Schleicher, uh, was that, uh, what was it? 53% of immigrants in Champaign County actually entered our community in 2010 or later. So I think our community has undergone a lot of different changes over the past decade, and that has created a lot of opportunities for institutions um, to respond and for our community to collectively learn about how do we adapt and be agile with regard to um, meeting the needs of our new neighbors. So people come and migrate for a lot of different reasons, whether you're doing migration from country to country, whether you're migrating from um, town to town, state to state. On the screen, I have listed some of the um, common reasons that people may find themselves in the United States, not just in our, um, in Champaign County. There's economic opportunity. People often come here to find better living conditions, jobs, or education. That's how my parents ended up in the United States um, in pursuit of better education. My dad came here and actually did his master's degree in DePaul, and they've been in the state of Illinois ever since, as have I. Um, some people were forced to migrate right um, through slavery or via human traffickers um, dating back um, centuries, but also very current um, as well. People also are indigenous to the land. They have lived here for thousands of years, but most of us have come here from other countries. Um, some of us come to unite with or create family, others to escape drought, famine, or natural disaster, and uh, many come to escape persecution persecution, violence, or war. Um, people don't necessarily only come for one reason. It can be a combination of uh, many of these different factors. And one thing I always invite people to do is um, to look at these slides and kind of in, invite you to identify what is your story and what is your connection um, with, you know, just the very human experience that we share of moving, right, to pursue different sorts of opportunities. That's something that um, is shared across the human experience, regardless of your country of origin. So, Immigrants in our community, there or foreign born individuals in our community, there's 25,000 of them. They seem to come here with different statuses. What are some of the differences? Um, so I just want to briefly go over refugee asylum seekers, immigrants, and non immigrants. Um, in the general language that we use at the New American Welcome Center, we talk about refugees, we talk about asylum seekers, and then we also talk about immigrants, not necessarily in the same way that um, the federal government talks about uh, immigrants, which is the definition I put on this slide here. But anyway, a refugee is someone who um, arrives to the United States already with a designated status as a refugee. They have been recognized prior to entering into the US that they 
have been fleeing persecution or they have a well-founded fear of persecution because of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. If you're approved as a refugee and you enter the country, that comes with um, benefits before you enter and also after you enter. So prior to entry, you'll receive a medical exam, a cultural orientation, help with your travel plans, and if you need it, a loan for your travel. And after you arrive, you're eligible for different forms of medical and cash assistance that will help you, you know, get your groceries and your rent um, and housing situated for the first several months that you're in the country. What's different about asylum seekers is that they have to qualify for, um, they have to meet the standard and definition of a refugee, refugee, which is fleeing from persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or because of political opinion, but they're already in the United States. Um, and so they, this can happen when people, for example, may come in on a tourist visa, um, they may be escaping really challenging um, conditions in their home countries and walking here on foot, they may fly in, they may sail in, they may boat in, they may walk in, whatever it is, um, these asylum seekers are seeking protection after they are inside of the United States. Um, they have to file for asylum within one year of their entry into the United States. And after a certain period after they do that, they may be eligible to apply for things like work authorization, cash and medical assistance, employment assistance, etc. The asylum seekers are a category in the United States that can be a lot more fraught. Um, and even just the designation of who is or who isn't a refugee, right, is um, often very politically complicated. Um, and so asylum seekers can be seeking affirmative asylum or they can be seeking defensive asylum, depending on how they entered the country um, and whether that form of entry was legal in the United States. For immigrants and non-immigrants, the basic definition based on U.S. immigration law is immigrant is someone who is lawfully in the United States but is not a U.S. citizen, is not a U.S. national, and is not a non-immigrant. And what is a non-immigrant? That's someone who is admitted into the U.S. on a temporary basis. So these are people who are here on temporary work visas. These are people who are here as students, for example, um, these are people who are here as tourists. So those are some of the um, differences and distinctions. I know that a lot of times in the zeitgeist, a lot of it is just kind of enmeshed together. And sometimes it's helpful to understand um, why it is important to distinguish between refugees and asylum seekers, because um, the protections that are afforded to them and the benefits that are afforded to them are actually very different. Um, and so there's different forms of advocacy that are related. Um, or required with that. So there are lots of immigrants in our community. We know that they enrich our social and cultural fabric. People are often also very curious about how do they make our community economically better, right? So immigrants make up a very significant share of our workforce and play a critical role in many key industries in Champaign County, whether it's education or manufacturing, hospitality and recreation, professional services and healthcare. I think you can see that just as you're going around town. Um, according to a economic and demographic snapshot that we were able to release with the help of a national partner, the New American Economy in 2017. Um, in 2016, the amount earned by immigrant households in Champaign County was $619 million. Of that, $119 million went to federal taxes and $57 million went to state and local taxes. This is regardless of whether someone um, is undocumented or documented because everyone pays taxes um, and contributes um, to the U.S. tax system. Immigrants in Champaign County also support federal social programs, and in 2016, they contributed $61.5 million to Social Security and $16.6 to Medicare. Uh, Gloria? Mm-hmm. Do, do you specifically mean immigrants on this slide? Do you not mean foreign born, foreign born individuals? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I ask a question as well. Is Go for what it. You is what is shown here somewhat typical for um, a community our size, or is it particularly weighted on the education side? And I, I guess I kind of expect right. I think our might be higher. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
I think it's higher given the sector. It reflects mm -hmm. the sectors that are in our community, right? We have the U of I in Parkland, we have Flexingate, we have Carl in OSF, for example. So naturally there's gonna be, um, I think a little bit more people in the area. Go ahead. Gloria, does it take time to make this level of contribution? I mean, might the bulk of this represent immigrants who've been here for decades? So if you're working here, you're paying taxes, right? So uh -huh. that can be within three weeks or, you know, within your first pay period. Uh -huh. So that can be a month after you arrive and you get a job. It can be whenever you start working. Right. Just wondering whether asylum seekers are able to secure employment that quickly. Okay. Um, asylum seekers, there is typically after you submit an asylum application, um, it takes you have to wait about 150 days before you can apply for employment authorization. And that is um, subject to approval. So you may or may not be able to work. Um, and so that can be very challenging um, for people to have to wait during that period. Um, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so those were some of the you know, where are people coming from? What statuses um, are they arriving under? What are their economic contributions? So what are some of the challenges and needs? So um, a few years ago, we surveyed community members, both US born and foreign born about um, just a little over 800 people in total, just to understand, you know, like what are your challenges? What kind of supports do you need? It was part of a broader, community um, engagement process that we utilize to inform recommendations that would move our institutions forward in a form of accountability to make our community more welcoming. But I think some of, um, I picked out a couple of responses from the survey that I think are particularly interesting um, because it both shows things that are similar between US born and foreign born communities, but also things that are very distinct, right? So whenever you move to a new place, if you don't already have community there, it's hard to be far away from friends and family, right? Um, but if you're already a U.S. citizen and moving to another place and you were born in the U.S. and already English proficient, learning English is not going to be an issue for you. But learning English is a very common challenge um, for many, many um, foreign-born individuals in our community, as is finding employment. And so um, with regard to the top uh, forms of support that folks are typically looking for. It's employment opportunities. And it's not just necessarily like having a job. It is having a job that is um, matches the level of education that they have. Um, it's having a job that matches the career trajectory that they want um, and matches the job they, want, they hope to have um, once their English proficiency is higher. Folks are also commonly looking for more educational opportunities and um, with typically limited resources when first arriving in a community um, support navigating and accessing basic health care. So I'd like to say that that's a little bit of where the New American Welcome Center at the University YMCA comes in. Um, so for folks who may not already be familiar with us. Um, we are part of the University YMCA, which has been around for 150 years, celebrating our sesquicentennial this year. Um, but the New American Welcome Center was launched in 2017. And the purpose of the work that we do is to make a, our community a place where all immigrants, all foreign born individuals can thrive and flourish. And we do this by engaging local institutions and mobilizing community resources to ensure equitable access to services, economic opportunity, and a meaningful belonging. Some of um, our signature programs include an immigrant helpline, this is a multilingual helpline that is run in, I think at this point, six different languages. And the purpose of it is to bridge the gap to resources and reduce barriers to incredible resources that are already available in the community. So whether it's because of technology barriers, language barriers, cultural barriers, lack of trust, what have you, um, sometimes it can be challenging for someone to go to the DMV, for example, or even 
um, navigate at the library or um, try to enter a government building for the first time. And so we want to make sure that people have um, the language accessibility, have the resources and the confidence and the knowledge that they need to enter those spaces and we'll accompany them into those spaces. We also um, support people with regard to different forms of financial need that they may have. And so this became particularly um, salient during the pandemic when a lot of people um, were significantly impacted by the pandemic and um, really encountered a lot of housing, food insecurity, economic insecurity. And so we connect folks with different forms of financial assistance in the community. And then thanks to the generosity of a lot of different community members and funders, we are also able to provide direct financial assistance and to date have um, connected people with over a million dollars in assistance to keep their businesses afloat or to make their rental payments, et cetera. We also have, as Joan mentioned in immigration legal services and assistance program. And so we don't have any attorneys on staff, but we have a special designation from the U.S. Department of Justice to practice immigration law. And that allows us to get people um, on the pathway to citizenship, um, help them apply for their green cards, help them apply to become U.S. citizens, help them apply for asylum, apply for temporary protected status, different forms of humanitarian parole, et cetera. Um, we do a lot of education and outreach in the community that we try to make sure is contextualized to uh, the different communities that we serve. Our current key focus communities are the local Francophone, particularly the Congolese community, also the local AAPI community with leadership from um, staff members from the Korean, Chinese, and Taiwanese community. And then we also focus on the local Latina community, um, particularly with the focus on the Mexican community and also Central American, particularly the Guatemalan community. Um, and we chose those three primary communities, the Latina community, the Congolese community and the AAPI community, because those are three communities in which we have seen a lot of need. And um, those are three communities in which we have really invested in um, recruiting, retaining, um, and um, growing staff experience um, and leadership. And so we have local immigrants who are staffing these programs and also recruiting existing and emerging leaders from these different communities to uh, volunteer as guides um, to navigate the different resources that we have in the community. So that's a little bit about um, what we do at the New American Welcome Center. I'm just checking my notes to see there's anything big here. Um, this is just a picture of our team at our last retreat in February. So almost a year ago, I think something that's really cool about our team is it's a blend of both U.S. born and foreign born residents, about half and half. And about a third of the folks on our staff team actually started with us as volunteers. And so whether they were immigrants volunteering as community navigators in our education and outreach initiatives, or they joined us as, for example, AmeriCorps, um, volunteers, or they were interns with us in college and then decided to pursue careers with us afterward. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was, you know, how, what does it cost to run this work and support this work? We are almost exclusively grant funded, and so we rely on um, a lot of different forms of funding from federal, state, and local government, also from um, philanthropy um, to forward the work. I think this is something that uh, um, really allows us to invest deeply in our community um, in different ways. And you'll see probably a lot of names and organizations that you recognize, particularly on the right-hand side um, of different folks in the community who are really invested in making sure that immigrants in our community um, are thriving for the long term and making an investment um, with their dollars in that. Of course, we're not the only ones who are working on immigrant inclusion and response. Um, we try to make this as collaborative as possible. And so from the beginning, we have taken a multi-sector response to engage everyone from elected officials to folks from the public sector and private sector, faith leaders and nonprofits, as well as a special focus on immigrant leaders who weren't already involved in those other um, 
sector areas. Um, there was a question about, you know, how does this impact, for example, um, the school districts? And we work very closely with the school districts. And for example, Unit 4, um, they do have done a lot of things to support immigrant families in recent years. And I know uh, the same is true of the Urbana School District to do things like provide bilingual parent liaisons who serve to facilitate um, interactions and relationships between families and teachers and helping them to navigate in a new place and making sure that students are acclimated, whether um, they are already literate or not, um, whether they, um, no matter what level of school that they've come in, and currently all school communications, I think at both both Unit 4 and USD 116, um, come out also not only in English, but in Spanish and French, which I think is really cool um, and is huge in terms of parents don't always have to put things through a translator or try to figure out what things mean. Um, and on the right hand side is um, some of the primary um, immigrant service and advocacy agencies that you'll run into around town. There's the Refugee Center, which is the oldest um, foreign born serving entity in our community. They were founded in the 70s as a mutual assistance center um, by refugees from Vietnam um, and have really um, continued to make a really meaningful impact in our community um, over the past year and a half. They have done a particularly heavy lift with regard to welcoming and housing and getting settled into the workplace, all of the things for evacuees from Afghanistan. Um, and um, that has been an incredible lift from them and their staff are just amazing. The Immigration Project is the largest um, immigration legal services provider south of I-80. Um, there isn't a lot of immigration legal services south of I-80, uh, but the Immigration Project has been doing that for the longest, and they are based in Bloomington, but they have a satellite office here, and that's where their focus is. Pishan Kenobe is a recent collective um, that really cropped up in the past, I think, three years or so, and their focus is on language justice, particularly for the local indigenous Maya community from Guatemala. And what makes their work so amazing is that um, there's, you know, a growing Guatemalan population in our community, and they have very particular challenges with navigating the local, for example, medical system, court system, um, education system, et cetera. But many folks who come here, Spanish is their second language. They speak an indigenous dialect. And so um, language access in particular has been very, very challenging oftentimes, even when they, for example, if they're at Carl with a medical appointment, meeting with a doctor, um, to understand the care that they're receiving, it has to go um, in their native language, into Spanish, into English, and then all the way back. Um, and so what the collective is really trying to do is to equip and, and empower and train um, leaders from the local indigenous Maya community um, to take lead and to, um, yeah, to take lead in that area. And then, of course, there's also Immigrant Services of Champaign-Urbana, and they um, do a lot of um, connecting people with different resources in the community, whether it's making sure that people have transportation um, to what they need and or to um, different like food resources, etc. All of us work pretty closely together in what's loosely called the immigrant cooperative. Um, we do this because it's important for us to be communicating with one another, to be working in complement with each other. And also, um, we often find that um, it makes more compelling arguments for securing the necessary resources to support our community. So one recent example of that is we did a collective um, ask of the Champaign County Board for American Rescue Plan funding to um, increase access to mental health services in the community. And so that's a very exciting initiative that we're working on together as a collective to try to uh, reduce barriers to mental health counseling, therapy, psychological evaluations, etc. cetera. So, um, those are the work that I just described is very important in the day-to-day -day realities um, of 
newcomer arrivals in our community, also people who are just here for the long term but continue to struggle because of different barriers that they face, um, but they don't necessarily forward longer term institutional change. And so that's also something that we care a lot about and that we've built a responsive framework around. Um, and the way that we did that was through the publication or creation of what we call the Champaign County Welcoming Plan, which focuses on several key areas um, that we know that our community needs to together take action on, from economic integration and employment to citizenship and civic engagement, health and well-being, all the different things that you see here. And how we came to these recommendations and strategies was through actually several years of extensive community engagement and input, surveying um, both U.S. born and foreign born individuals, um, conducting focus groups, and also um, really reviewing a lot of different data, including some of the data that I shared with you earlier here. And again, this is another example of, I think one of the things that makes Champaign County distinct from some of the other communities with a lot of immigrants um, around the country that I've seen is that um, people come together to make sure that impacted communities um, are able to thrive. And so I have logos of all the different people and entities that were involved as part of the process of developing the plan. We're about a year into implementation on the plan. Um, we've been expanding partnerships. We've launched communities of practice in each of the areas from citizenship and civic engagement to language and education. We're also um, trying to secure funding to support um, those efforts. We haven't quite yet gotten to an annual report and a website creation, but we wanna make sure that the work we're doing is accountable um, to the community at large and that this isn't another report that kind of just gets put on the shelf. Um, something really exciting is we are in the final stages of trying to secure a formal designation. Um, called Certified Welcoming. Um, it's a designation, a national designation for cities and counties um, in the United States that have created policies and programs that reflect their values and commitment to immigrant inclusion. So to date, there have been 18 cities and countries across um, the US that have been certified and hopefully in May of 2023, the city of Champaign will become certified welcoming and soon to follow that, Champaign County, Urbana, Savoy, Rantoul, who knows. Um, so that is the wrong direction <laughs> we go forward. That's all I have for my prepared slides. Um, I just have some bullet points on here for if you ever want to direct anyone for assistance, you can direct them to our helpline. They can call that number. They can text that number. It's a helpline, not a hotline. So we're not operating 24 seven, but folks can always leave a message and we'll get back to them and they can leave the message in their native language. And we'll make sure that someone who speaks that is able to respond to them. They can also, you can also ask folks, folks to send an email to la linea at universityymc.org. Um, if you're on Facebook, I encourage you to follow us. That's where we're regularly posting information about programs or different updates that about news that impacts immigrants in our community. If you want to read the plan in full, um, the QR code, if you have your phone, you can just point it at it. Um, I can also send Joan a link afterward for folks who may be interested. Um, you can read the plan in full. And then Folks who may be interested in volunteering, we do currently have some openings, um, particularly in our tutoring program, which is something that we started during the pandemic for K through 12 students um, in immigrant families that just needed a little extra assistance um, with virtual learning, but now even with in-person learning um, in a variety of different subjects. And we try to um, pair tutors and tutees together based on interest area based on maybe languages spoken. Um, we're all, also always looking for interpreters and translators to help us with different documents. And if anybody wants to intern, we currently have a crew of nine interns who are volunteering over 100 hours a week um, in all the different areas of our work from legal services to grants and special projects and the helpline. And my email is also on here for anyone who would who wants to contact me, so. 
wow, that was that was a wonderful presentation, and you you've covered so many of the points. So thank you so much for for taking the time to do all this, Gloria. Um, I've learned a lot. I've learned some new words. I think asylee, I think was one word I did <laughs> not know before. Um, in terms of your the, the I was particularly interested in your the last piece on K twelve tutoring. Uh, are, are those services generally offered through the school as well, or uh, what what is unique about the need uh, that you're serving uh, within that that space? Sure, yeah, the need that we're serving in this space is really, um, it's to help students, but it's also to help parents navigate the school system as well. Um, and so some of that includes, you know, I don't really know what my child has been assigned or why they're working on the subject, um, or how can I be more supportive of them? And, it's, and it also helps um, children communicate just like generationally with their parents, sometimes it's helpful to have um, a mediator um, who can go between all of our tutors, undergo cultural and linguistic um, agility training. And so it also helps to contextualize and helps people better understand the different communities that they're working with. Great. But do we have some questions from the audience now? There's one in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, so can hey, you read David. it? I can't read it. <laughs> yeah, I can read it. Hi, David. Good to see you. <laughs> David's question is Could you comment on the case management? Ah, thank you. Yes. To assisting refugees and asylum seekers and how this approach could be coordinated among the various local immigrant service organizations. I think that every organization that I'm aware of has a different approach to case management. Um, some of us have social workers on staff, some don't. Um, people navigate it in different ways, but I think we always try to coordinate because um, someone may come in because, for example, to the New American Welcome Center because they need help applying for asylum. But in addition to needing help applying for asylum, which is something that we can offer assistance with um, when we have capacity, they may also need um, transportation services to their appoint their court case appointment in Chicago. And that's something, for example, that we reach out to immigrant services of Champaign Urbana because they have a regular volunteer roster. Um, folks may also need food services. And sometimes the regular um, food places that we're sending people to may run out. So we may tap on someone at the refugee center and say, like, hey, do you have anything um, that is available? Immigrant Services of Champaign-Urbana also has a, is it a free store that you have? Is that what you call it, David? Um, with like beds and mattresses, which is super helpful for supplying different things. Um, but does that yes. answer your question? Um, uh, uh, partially, the, um, it, uh, the, the aspect it doesn't answer is, uh, um, uh, subsidizing uh, emergency needs such as um, rent and and um, utility payments and and that sort of thing. You know what uh, uh, what's the coordination um, in that regard? Sure. So I think it's it's very case specific, depending on what people need, depending on what their immigration status is, depending on um, what they may or may not qualify for and what um, forms of assistance that they've already utilized. And so um, sometimes um, we always try to, for example, if someone is coming for rental assistance, refer them to the Regional Planning Commission. Um, but sometimes because of eligibility requirements or just time sensitivity, that's not possible. And I know that um, there are several organizations in town that have their own emergency response funds that are able to serve them, including the New American Welcome Center. And so um, for folks who aren't able to access other forms of assistance in an expedient manner when they need to do so, we offer emergency assistance. And um, I think that each of the organizations communicate pretty well with each other with regard to 
um, what assistance is available. And we have even done shared assistance before because typically, you know, someone who is coming to us and looking for help, they don't care if you're ISCU or the New American Welcome Center or the Refugee Center, they just need their help. And so it's really important that we're working together cohesively um, with that. And it's not that it always goes smoothly, um, but I think that um, it's an area where we continue to improve and our staff work more and more cohesively together. Um, and Prisland um, has asked on the on the April 4th ballot, the various offices, mayor, city council, school board, Parkland trustees, uh, what questions relating to our immigrant communities should voters be asking candidates to address? Yeah, I think that is a wonderful question and a question that um, I would love for our community navigators to answer. So I'm actually going to copy that um, and I can send that back to you. I also, one of the things that we're trying to do with our community navigators team is increase opportunities for civic engagement with them. and. and in the Champaign County welcoming plan, one of the things that we're trying to do is figure out um, the city of Champaign, for example, has a government 101 program, um, but it's run in English. And so we're trying to figure out, is there a way to make that more accessible um, to the immigrant community by having language specific cohorts, for example? Um, so I don't have a specific answer on the spot for you right now, Anne, um, but I am happy to take that back to the team. I see another private question um, from not David Dorman, another David that says, how exactly do you help immigrants gain citizenship? And we do that um, through three primary formats. The first is we do a lot of education. So we do presentations and outreach to inform people about the eligibility requirements and also the benefits of becoming a US citizen. Not everyone who is eligible wants to become a US citizen. Um, I think that's something that sometimes people take for granted, but there's a lot of different considerations that go into people um, deciding whether or not they want to become a U.S. citizen. Um, but when they make that decision, we help them through the process after we educate them by connecting them with ESL classes um, at Urbana Adult Education, which has a specific course called ESL for Citizenship. Our next session is actually starting this coming Monday. It runs Mondays and Wednesdays from 5.30 to 8. So if anybody is interested, it's not too late to enroll. I'm happy to share additional information about that as well. And that is a really important preparation class for people who um, may not feel confident about, for example, their English speaking ability or may have questions about the naturalization process. And that's a really great space for them to connect with peers um, who are going through the same experience. And then finally, through our immigration um, legal service providers, our DOJ accredited representatives, we're actually able to walk people through their entire application from A to Z, help them collect the necessary documents, get anything translated that needs to be translated and we submit the application and continue to follow up with United States Citizenship and Immigration Services until they hopefully um, secure citizenship status and we can also help folks apply for, for example, their students, their partners, etc. Do the uh, local school systems offer um, language courses as well? Uh, that's kind of a follow-up that Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the local school systems do have special language cohorts, um, ESL classes, ELL programs, multilingual programs um, for students. And in addition to that, um, there's, of course, Urbana Adult Education Center and also Parkland College with ESL. And also I see a question about Project READ at Parkland, which is really, really fantastic. Um, we regularly um, send people um, there. We also try to recruit volunteers for Project READ. We think it's an amazing program. And we've also sent staff there um, who we've wanted to work on particular um, skills to improve their ability, not to navigate within their own communities, but to um, have better confidence in navigating the community at large. Um, do we feel that our uh, local libraries do a good job in providing books in multiple languages? Is that something that they, they've addressed? 
Yes, absolutely. I think I should disclose that I am a board member at the Urbana Free Library and I love everything about it. I think the multilingual collection is amazing and that the work that um, both libraries have been doing um, to make sure that the collections are reflective, not only in the children's department, but in adults department, both digitally and in print um, of the different language needs, interests um, of our community is really, really incredible and amazing. Do you think Rantoul uh, is in the same category? That I don't know. I would hazard to guess mm -hmm. yes, but I I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, yeah. Rantoul is an area that um, we love to say that we serve Champaign County, um, but that is a work in progress. We actually recently just opened um, last month a satellite office out at Community Service Center in Northern Champaign County, which is out in Rantoul. And we expect that by having more physical presence there, um, we'll be able to get a better sense of pulse by not making people drive all the way to Champaign. Um, I see Trisha's question um, with, are there many who have no route to a legal status? Unfortunately, yes, there are many, many, many. And so for folks who may have been following, you know, just what's been going on at the border recently, um, the people who are being haphazardly um, shuttled on buses all over the place. Um, the city of Chicago, for example, has um, I think at this point, and since the end of August, welcomed um, around 4,000 asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. Many of um, these people don't have what the U.S. government would consider to be um, viable petitions for asylum. And many of them may not ultimately have pathways to legal status, um, which is really unfortunate. They're different, um, but just, um, I would always say that um, it's always good if you meet anyone in the community who has questions about whether or not they have a route to legal status, to always refer them to an immigration legal services practitioner because there is always particularities about different circumstances that may allow them to adjust their status. Sometimes it can be because of tragic circumstances, like being a victim of a crime or assault, something like that. Um, but there are different things that only a legal provider can assess. Um, so yes, there are many who have no route to legal status, who were severely and significantly impacted by the pandemic and who um, contribute to our taxes and our economy on a daily basis, but um, will be working for many, many years of their life and not be able to receive anything um, at the end of it. So um, I, for, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm going to see if Kanitha wants to come live. Kanitha, you've come back on. I, I was going to ask if you wanted to share any of your own personal experience. Uh oh, we had, we, we <laughs> well, had talked uh, at a at a, uh, the Houlihan's um, uh, bar. <laughs> what am I saying here? The the uh, gathering we had at Houlihan's, and she was extremely pleased that we were doing this program. And I thought she might want to share her her own experience. But we'll we'll pass on that for now. So Carol well, is um, asking. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm back here. Oh, good. Here. Yeah. Would, would well, you like to share your experience? Yeah, um, uh -huh. briefly. I have to say that I'm so grateful to the league uh, for inviting Gloria. Um, it's like me looking at back at my life for the past 25 years. And Gloria, all I have to say, I wish I knew this program. <laughs> my life would have been easier. Um, and it is true that it is really hard and a lot of immigrants just smile um, because we don't, the community just, just look at each other and we know that there's no need to complain. Um, it would take too many hours to complain. We just smile, um, but it is, it is everything that Gory and all the volunteers, you know, will be doing, will be greatly appreciated because there's so many layers, um, many layers um, and very complex. Um, and everything that put in will really 
uh, cultivate uh, the our community because um, immigrants brought in with them a lot of uh, different perspective, diversity of ideas, and um, I would say that I am, you know, um, I'm very sorry, a little emotional because like all everything Gloria said, just like so, so on point. Um, I'm very grateful to the league for having me uh, to serve and to volunteer because. Um, it takes a lot to learn English, to learn culture, to learn how to register people to vote, <laughs> you know, to, um, yeah, communicate and everything. Um, so I feel like we, we work, you know, when people said, oh, we work 300% just to do the same thing is not uh, something to be exaggerating at all. You know, uh, okay. sometimes I just, joke with my husband like honey you forgot that I'm not from here what about you think of doing the same thing I'm doing but in Thai because I'm from Thailand can you imagine writing an article in Thai speaking to people in Thai trying to register, register people to vote in Thai and he got quiet um so you know um I I am just like so I know I'm repeating myself how much um, I appreciate the league for wanting to learn, to go off, go off your comfort zone, to want to understand um, the complexity of um, the community. And I saw a lot of questions uh, asking how to help. And yeah, I, I, I thank so you much. for that so uh, much. Yeah. Thanks, Kenneth. I'm, I'm glad you were able to join us. She wasn't sure because of her her own uh, duties on campus, but uh, Gloria. So it's it's wonderful that we're we're able to uh, have you with us. And I that's my alarm to see if we had any last questions. And uh, Carol Bosley was asking um, the. Uh, about the demographic numbers at the beginning. Uh, did that include Rantoul? What were they Champaign yeah, County? Yeah, it's Champaign numbers? County. So uh -huh. it does include Rantoul. Um, and, I don't have and, like the specific breakdown of foreign born in Rantoul for you, but the overall number are for the county at large. For your other question, Carol, we do hear of um, different sorts of um, circumstances in the workplace and a lot of what our community navigators try to do is do a lot of know your rights training um, for people and we've also brought in folks to talk about know your rights in the workplace when it makes sense um, and is possible we will try to advocate and investigate sometimes we'll refer out to um, folks who are much more equipped to handle those kinds of matters, but it is something that does happen, but I think um, we don't hear about it very frequently, um, which hopefully is a good thing. Um, Gloria and friends, I don't know if, if you can hear me. We can. Um, yeah. I'm. We're just so close to the end of this meeting and I've been so lame trying to participate in two Zoom meetings simultaneously, I apologize. Um, I've been in and around the Wyon campus enough to marvel at Gloria's competent, energetic, take care of business self. You're like a role model to me, Gloria. And here I'm gonna sound like one of these legislators who says, my hearts and prayers are with you. <laughs> vote against or fail to support common sense gun control legislation, but my heart does go out to you so early in this new lunar year of the rabbit. And from Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay, I, I know this has to affect our local Asian American um, Pacific Islander community. And here I am being like one of those people who says, my heart is with you. I want my heart to be more than with you, but at least my heart is with you. And I'm, I'm thinking of you. And, and I, I'd like to be a take care of business competent person like you instead of just 
shriveling into this demoralized self who is so sad about how the new year started. But I, I couldn't let this opportunity end without telling you that my heart is with you, my friend. Thanks, you. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, for making those comments because it's something I was dealing with, whether I should bring it up or not. But obviously, we don't want to evoke pain for for Gloria, who's right, been so good to right, give us time. And, and it, 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 Gloria, thank is, you, Jenny. Yeah, I yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, it's always wonderful um, to see you around at the Y, um, and yeah, it has been a challenging week. And I think that one of the challenging parts of the experience is that um, one of the ways that Asian Americans often deal with um, different instances, whether it's violence or hate, et cetera, is that commonly what we experience is erasure because nobody talks about it. Nobody raises it. Um, it kind of gets kind of glossed over. And so I really appreciate you acknowledging it. And I really, really appreciate your solidarity. And it means a lot. And I'm definitely going to share it. Um, with our AAPI staff and community navigators, um, it will mean a lot to them. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, that's a kind of a down note to end on, but um, mm -hmm. we, we do so appreciate uh, you spending time with us and sharing your incredible wealth of uh, knowledge here. It was, uh, I, I think I'm overwhelmed with uh, how much you were able to cover and um, how how what lucky the community has been to have you in our presence. So thank you, Gloria. And let's give Gloria a round of applause and, and also the hearts. Like And it's it's recorded, right? So that we we can see it again and people who weren't able to watch it tonight will be able to. Yes. Right, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, thank I, you so much for having me and uh, special shout out to one of my first friends in Champaign County and Prisland, <laughs> who has been part of so many different pieces of the work um, at the Welcome Center. She participated in our first citizenship and civic engagement working group. She was part of developing the recommendations that made it into um, the pub publicized welcoming plan. She's um, been out to our citizenship classes, educating people about um, registering to vote and um, connected me with Barb Schleicher for um, get out the count initiatives. And so um, I know it's not just Anne, but just every time I think of her and um, her connections with the league and what the league does in general, I'm just so grateful. Um, and I know that we're currently working with Karen to um, make sure that voting information is accessible and makes sense and is contextualized for the different immigrant communities that we serve. So y'all are really awesome. Thanks for all you do. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I just had to give a special shout out to Anne. Uh, that's lovely to know. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm, yeah, it was um, a very special thing. I, I am a first generation American as many others are as well. So, uh, you know, all these issues are near and dear to so many of us in so many ways. So. Thanks, and we look forward to, to seeing everyone at future meetings. Good night.